Welcome to the Old Man of the Three Things with J.J. Redick and the Dunker Spot, Nikias Duncan and Steve Jones. Fellas, it's great to see you. Always love chopping it up with you on these Mondays. I decided to dedicate today's episode to our very own Jason Gallagher. And you may ask, why are you dedicating this episode to Jason Gallagher? Well, I'd like to call this episode The Algorithm. Because today oh. we are talking <laughs> about Wemby, Jokic, and LeBron. Sometimes we touch on some really niche things here on the Old Man of the Three Things. Today we're going mainstream. <laughs> today we're going mainstream. This is for the algo. You're welcome, Jason. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, let's start with Wemby, man. Let's start with Wemby. I, I want to touch on one thing first, which is we had a rookie of the year discussion right around Christmas. Uh, I think it was the first episode we put out uh, in January, in 2024. And to a certain fan base, I think our discussion came off a little flippant mm -hmm. when we were talking about Wembenyama's rookie of the year. For all three of us, I would like to apologize for that. I would like to apologize. However, at, I, and by the way, you can, and the Spurs fans did it. They, they literally examined every word, every bit of our body language. Like, I get it. We, we came across flippant. And I, I, I'm owning that. And I'm admitting that. And I'm apologizing for that. However, at the time, although I came off flippant, I still believed that at the time, I would have Chet Holmgren in the lead for Rookie of the Year at the time. Wembenyama uh, is having, I, I would say, one of the best rookie seasons of all time. I, I don't think that's like a hyperbole. Uh, his play of late has been outstanding. They've got their lineups right now where, like, when he's on the court, it's impacting winning. Now, it's not imp impacting winning at the highest level where they're, moving up the standings and, you know, going to be in the playoffs, but it's, it's really good basketball. And, uh, we're going to talk rookie of the year, I think at the end of this, but let's talk Wembenyama. What have you guys seen from him? And what have you guys seen from the Spurs of late that has you really excited? I think for me, I'll, I'll try to pull it into a uh, niche town for a little bit. For me, I'm having a lot of fun with the off-ball movement with Wimby offensively and the way that they are moving him around the chessboard, the way that they are using uh, Devin Vassell to screen for him, Trey Jones to screen for him. And from there, it's like, what do you do as a defense? Because you're not switching your smallest players onto this 7-4 demigod. And so now you're fighting over, you're trying to like knock him off his spots, and he is just too good, too slithery for you to be able to do that at this point. I think throughout the year, you know, I think everyone's kind of talked about what is the strength going to look like in year one. And like, obviously, there's room for him to get stronger. But I think as the year's gone on, he has done a better job of establishing positioning um, before he gets the catch. And once you pair that with these weird screening angles, these smaller screening partners, it's put so much strain on your defense. And then from there, like the handle has gotten tighter from him. He's been able to get to his spots. He's been able to boogie and ISO, like a position I think about. And he's had a ton of wild ones post All-Star break, which his numbers are absurd. We'll get into that. There was a play against Minnesota. It was a sideline play. Trey Jones inbounds the ball. Devin Vassell sets this down screen for Wimby. He catches in the middle of the paint against Kyle Anderson. Rudy Gobert is guarding Jeremy Sohan, so he just sinks down to doubles. Julian Champagne and Jeremy Sohan cut at the same time. And I'm just like, what is happening here? That's not great. Uh, but the ball finds its way back to Wimby, and he catches it on the right wing against Kyle Anderson. And this man goes full 2K ISO mode and flows into this side step three that touches nothing but bottom. And for me, it's like I like the, the usage. I like the initial idea. It's cool that they're getting different people to screen for him, getting them the ball in different areas. But then you just get to like the end of the day portions. Like Wimby can just shoot and knock down anything you want him to. And if he's going to knock down 44% of his pull-up threes like he has been post-All-Star break, I don't know what you do with him. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned this. Yeah, so I don't mean to interrupt. I just want to comment on that because that's where I think we all envisioned at some point. And 
I think for a lot of people, it was like, well, at some point in the future, in year three, in year four, and now it's like, no, we're just post All Star Break Rookie of the Year, and we're at that point. We're like, what do you do with him? <laughs> well, it, it's funny because in the guys we talked about the shot selection with Wimby, and then you look up and he's actually shooting forty one percent on pull up threes for the whole year. Last fifteen games is forty five point seven, and I think the the point you made about the cutting is really fun. One of the best parts about what San Antonio has done, uh, despite the noise about point guard play, let's open this up. Let's let Wimby play. Let's let them find out who they are. Let's not put him in a box. And so you get these plays where he grabs a rebound. He's going into pick and roll. Someone's screening for him. You have the set design plays where he's in the corner, comes off a pin down, and now he's playing out of it. And I think the growth has come from when he sees these cross matches and he's getting deeper in the paint. He's getting these deeper seals and going right to work. I, the one thing I want to add to that is the pick and roll play has been really fun with San Antonio going inverted action, having different people screen for him quickly. I think that's been great, especially when you not only add the pull up through shooting, but the passing to where you want to go show and recover as a defense, one dribble wrap around pass or one dribble. I'm very tall. I can still see this pass. So the passing has popped. And I think overall you put that together, the, the movement, his footwork, and you watch, like, we can talk about the screening at some point, but he's working to try and get, okay, let me get it to you, screen, oh, they went under, let's get another rescreen. let me get back into position, let's keep things moving. I think that's been really great. Like, I, I always feel bad for guys like Indiana, you know, Jalen Smith's just in help position, here comes Wimby, one plant, cut, lob, because I'm very tall. So it's it's been fun. There's been some good defense stuff. I know I know I'm sure JJ has some stuff. I am gonna push back though. Cause we did ask, hey, what's the path for Wimby at that point in time? And every game setting a historic thing that we've never seen before sure seems like the way to do it. I'll, I'll throw that out there. <laughs> and we talked about the efficiency. And and look, I'll 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 touch on that right now. I'll I'll touch on that right now because at the end of last season when Jalen Williams had his run post all-star break, I brought up the fact that he deserves some consideration. I didn't say Paulo does not deserve to be rookie of the year. I just said Jalen Williams deserves some consideration. And at the time, you know, magic fans killed me, which is fine. Like we're all going to stand for our people. Like I get it. Um, but I did say like the roles are different. Ultimately I voted for Ben Caro. Like it was not even a question for me. The roles are different. And I think in this case, between Chet and Wemby, the roles are very different, right? You're talking about a guy in Wembenyama who has the highest usage rate by any rookie in the last 45 years. In fact, he's number six in the entire NBA this season. And those guys ahead of him are Joel Embiid, Luka Doncic, Shea Gilgis-Alexander, Giannis Antetokounmpo, and Anthony Edwards. Like, that's what he's being asked to do. That's what he's being asked to do. He is a high usage player as a rookie. One of the highest usage players in the NBA this season. So you have to account for role. You have to account for what's being asked. And you certainly have to account for the talent around him. I think we can all agree Chet has more talent around him. By the way, Oklahoma City fans, I'm not talking anyone out of Chet Holmgren, you know, still being in the rookie of the year race. I'm just framing Wembenyama. So chill out. I see some of you getting uncomfortable. A <laughs> uh, couple things on what Steve said. The wraparound passes are so fun. They're so fun. I love that. I love the inverted pick and rolls. Uh, hopefully we'll have more on inverted pick and rolls later this week um, because I'm, I love it. And the, the most important thing you said was the growth with the cross matches because what I have seen early in the year was him just playing, right? And to a degree, Pop just letting him play. And what I've seen lately is more thought to how I'm playing and where I can exploit mismatches and where I can exploit my size and where can I exploit my, my unique skill set. The thinking part of it is the growth to me. And we're going to touch more on that later. I do want to get into some of these stats, okay? Uh, so he's number one in the league in blocks per game, number one in total blocks, number 12 in steals. I said this at the beginning of the year, you know, at some point he's just going to be his own defense, right? He's just going to be his own defense. 
Uh, he had 31, 12, six assists, six blocks in the win versus Pacers. He's the first rookie with 25 points, five assists, five blocks in consecutive games since blocks became official in 1973, 1974. He's only the fourth player ever to do that in consecutive games. In his last eight, he's averaging 25, 12, and five assists and 5.4 blocks on 51-42 shooting splits. He's the third player ever to average that in an eight-game span. He shot 45% on threes his last 12. He's the first player ever in NBA history history with 50 blocks and 25 made three-pointers over a 12-game span. There's what's crazy. This I, this is from Matthew Williams. Shout out to Matthew Williams, uh, our stats guru over at ESPN. He has the most points per minute for a rookie since Michael Jordan in 1984-85. And here's the the sort of the icing on the cake for me. He's the only player. Think about this stat. He, this frame this stat, Jason Gallagher. He's the only player in NBA history with 175 assists. 175 blocks and 75 made threes in a season. It's March 4th. He's the only NBA player in history to do this. What the fuck? <laughs> I don't you I, what I, don't the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you do that. Like I think about when we had our earlier conversation, Steve, I kind of talked about rookie of the year as well, um, on the dunker spot where you know, early on, especially when we had our conversation on the old man three things, like I think we all had Chet ahead because of his role within what OKC was doing, go both into the floor, the efficiency gap. There was also, if you cared about that portion early on in the season, there was a game slash minutes gap between the two as well. And now that Wimby is no longer on the minutes restriction, he's playing more consistently, and he's also doing all of this. Like it's easy to say, yep, this is what it was back in December. This is what it is right now. It's it's fine to do so. Like the Wimby stats you just <laughs> dropped also are just insane. Like I had some second spectrum stuff about what he's doing coming off screens. Um, some of the pick and roll defense stuff that's gotten bit, like, that's probably the scariest part. They, like, as he's I want to hear him. I want to hear him. Let's, let's oh. use these. This is fun. <laughs> this is fun. Stats are fun. I'm, this is the nerd. This is, this is my favorite part of the show. This is why I do this show on Mondays. I want to nerd out. Nikias. let's go. Give me the stats. Okay, we'll, we'll go very quickly. Um, with Wimby coming off of screens post-All-Star break, 1.52 points per possession on those trips when Wimby's coming off of a screen. That's and second to Scotty Barnes. Off-ball screens, yeah. Yes. So that is uh, second to Scotty Barnes among 113 players to receive at least 25 of those. Um, as we talk about the usage with Wimby as a screen or a handoff partner, the partnership between him and Devin Vassell has been really good. 1.2 points per possession on those. Uh, post All Star break, quick salute to Jackson Frank, who just wrote an article about Spurs and how they're using Wimby there. That sparked the search for me. Um, among 29 players to defend at least 100 pick and rolls post All Star break, 0. 0.78 points per possession allowed on those trips. That is second to Brooke Lopez. That seems pretty darn good, <laughs> I would say. Um, and then just in terms of traditional pick and roll duos, um, 82 with at least 30 reps since the All Star break. The Trey Jones Victor Wimbayama pick and roll at 1.38 points per possession is fourth in the league. That is behind Giannis and Brooke. Luka Doncic and P.J. Washington and Derek White and Christoph Porzingis continue to blitz the league with their partnership. So, like, that's some of the stuff. And then on the year, uh, the Spurs with a 113.9 defensive rating uh, would, would be on the court. Her cleaning the glass, that would be the equivalent of eighth. With him off the floor, not only is it the worst defense in the league, it is the worst defense in the league by nearly three points per 100 possessions when he is on the bench. Hmm. And so as he is figuring out some of the minor things with footworks, like low-key, he's towards the bottom in terms of drop coverage. This year, which is funny, he's still blocking a bunch of shots, altering a whole bunch of others. Teams take way fewer shots at the rim with him on the court. He's having this impact now, and there are objective things to point to, that he can clean up the footwork here. He can clean up some of the depth in this drop here, and he's this impactful already. Like, he's top 10 in defensive EPM this year. It's ridiculous what he's doing. Can I, can I nerd out non-stat division real quick? Yes. I think my favorite part is watching what teams try to do to move him around the court. Um, you know, cause Pacers run stack pick and roll. Wimby's just like, absolutely not. I'm just going to move around this. Cause I'm very tall in transition. Pascal Siakam just has a rhythm corner three. Wimby's on the block. Wimby just slowly lurks towards him, and you just see shot fake. Nope. I'm just going to pass this started the second half 
And they were like, fine, Wimby, we'll put you in the strong side corner. We'll put you over here in the right corner. This will surely help this with us. A Halliburton goes screen. Nimhard turns the corner, goes left. Hey, guess who's there? Victor Wimbanyama. <laughs> <laughs> just whatever, man. I'll, I'll just come block this. And my favorite bit is like more guys, you know, we've seen the highlights of people getting some on him, being physical with him, hitting him. My favorite thing now is when someone tries to hit him, you just see a limb go in the air as he continues to trap the ball with his foot. And he's just like, hey, I'm still here. Like, you hit me and I took it. But, like, you have to now shoot over my hand. And and the odds are in my favor. That's my favorite thing he does. Very quickly, because, JJ, as you mentioned a little bit earlier, and Stevie brought it up as well, just what he's doing against – what he's doing positioning-wise when he sees these cross matches. Quickly wanted to look this up. Um, on post-ups against non-centers, post-All-Star break, 1.24 points per possession on those post-ups from Victor Wimbenyama which is one of the best marks in the league. It's higher than Jokic. Yeah. And yeah, I was going to say, historically, I mean, I've, I've looked this data up for something else I was working on, I don't know, maybe 10 days ago. A 1.24 post-up efficient, you know, points per direct post-up efficiency rate would be number one in the league in, in most years of the tracking era. Number one. And Porzingis, I think, would probably, you know, his is the highest all time, but I want to say 1.24 may, may be the second highest. I mean, it, I think I had a couple at 1.23, right? So, like, that's those are insane numbers. And again, post-All-Star break against cross matches, so it's not overall, but still, that's what we were talking about in terms of figuring out how to exploit those cross matches. You guys touched on a couple things that I just... I, I have a very broad question here because when I had a couple Spurs games early on, and so we would ask Pop in our coaches' meetings about... Uh, Vic and and one of the themes that happened uh, over and over was he would talk about fundamentals, right? And again, uh, w- in my discussion for this week's Old Man in the Three, I have a former player on a former All Star, and we talked about the difference between skill set and fundamentals, right? There's there's the skill set conversation, which is all the things that he can do on a basketball court, and then the fundamentals, which every young player now coming into the league has to learn. Because it's not necessarily being taught, as particularly in America, it's not being taught, right? And to me, the footwork piece has gotten a lot better. The balance was something that Pop talked a ton about. The balance on his shot is getting a lot better. You guys brought up the shot selection. That's getting better. I thought early in the year there was some like, what the... are you doing type shit? You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and so the overall question is just related to fundamentals. Are you guys seeing his fundamentals? You brought up drop coverage footwork, right? Are you seeing at least the fundamentals trending in the right direction? Have they gotten better throughout this season? I, I would say yes. And I point to the drive numbers aren't much higher, but when he faces up, He's a lot more comfortable setting up the jab and going. And it's a lot more fluid than it used to be, even if he absorbs contact. Um, when he sets and come off screens, you can feel that movement and he's setting you up with the plant. And so I think those little things are helping him shine through in a different level. I, I think defensively, you feel it more too, because you can see him work, feeling better in space, not just being like, I'm tall, I'm blocking off this part of the court where, no, I'm going to show, I'm going to help, I'm going to recover, I'm going to close back out, I'm going to keep the ball back in front. So I think having that better movement has also allowed more confidence, especially with physical contact. So I think it kind of goes hand in hand for me. What are you saying, guys? Um, yeah, I think for me, like, it's gotten better. Like, I just look at what he's doing once, like, the double team comes. Like, I think he's doing a better job of diagnosing that without getting too loose with the ball. And even as he's dealing with contact on the block, if he goes with an up fake, he doesn't like it. Like, the pivots seem cleaner. He's not losing his footing. He's not losing his balance as much as he was earlier in the year, which, you know, to that point, he would lose his balance and still have his arm, like, half a foot above whoever's contesting the shot, and he can still get those shots to go in. But it does feel like that's gotten better, and I feel like that's a part of why you're seeing him get to the free throw line a little bit more. Uh, I think there is just an efficiency of movement and just an overall decisiveness when he has the ball inside the arc that I'm really starting to enjoy. And to the screening portion, like post-All-Star break, look this up really quickly, connected to nearly 60% of his own ball screens this year. Um, I will just be kind and say that that number is higher than what it was earlier in the year. Um, I have some like rookie report stuff and my notes from that on that portion. 
he's getting better at actually making contact. And Steve nailed it earlier about his willingness to rescreen and how he's setting it up without getting like the moving screen and stuff like that. So for me, it's very much trending upward. And that is a fun slash terrifying thought for the rest of the league. It's just fun. It's just fun. I, 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 basketball is fun. I called Saturday night's game in Los Angeles and like, I get to sit courtside and watch Nikola Jokic play. And I get to sit courtside and watch Jamal Murray's bag. And I get to sit courtside and watch LeBron. It's just fun. It's just fun. And I think with Jokic right now and the Denver Nuggets, it feels like they've hit another gear. You know, Malone told us in the, in the pregame, he said, they lose those three games coming into All-Star break. And, and Jokic sent like a group text, like, you know, unsolicited. Just, nobody told him to do it. He said, sent a group text just about the second half of the season. Think back to last year. They secured the number one seed. They got a big win against Memphis. And, and then they kind of punted the last few weeks of the regular season. Seems like we're seeing the exact opposite of that happening right now. They're 6-0 and since the break. The defense has been outstanding. Jokic has been, has been nuts. He's been nuts. Uh, 25 points a game, 14 rebounds a game, 12 assists a game. 1.8 steals, 1.0 blocks. We talked about his defense last week. Look, I, I, I think it. I think it's time. Like, let's 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 have a let's have a real MVP discussion. We're we're past the 60 game mark, much less the 50 game mark. With me in the MVP discussion right now, I think there's two guys that have separated themselves, and I would probably put three guys in the next tier. And and the two guys that have separated themselves to me are Nikola Jokic and Shea Gilgis-Alexander. The next three guys to me are Giannis, for sure. Bucks up to second place. They're 40 and 21. He's been awesome. I'm going to get into some of these advanced stats, which typically are the, the sort of the harbinger for the, the, the MVP, uh, the, the, the stats more, most correlated with, with MVP. I would put Luka in there, although Dallas, after a, a great stretch, now has lost some games. They're in eighth place, two games back of sixth. And I would, of course, put Tatum in there. I think Boston fans across NBA Twitter right now are, are like, why isn't Tatum getting any love? Okay, I'm giving him some love. Like, he's in the MVP discussion. He's in the top five to me for sure. I think he, in some ways the narrative piece hurts with him because, you know, they have such a fucking good team and they're so complete. Uh, but he's having a, a sick, sick season. The pull-up threes, the playmaking, we've seen, like, he's improved. He's improved. So those are my five. Want to get your thoughts on that, and then I'll get into some of these sort of advanced stats. Um, I think that's a fair five. I think like I think just the bottom of that second tier or entering the third tier is like where a lot of the fun discussion pieces come. I put you know fun in air quotes where you have your Donovan Mitchells, you have your Kevin Durant's and other guys like that. You can kind of argue for five. Um, I'm very much with you in that Shea and Jokic seem to be the top two in whatever order. And I do kind of wonder, I think about something that Zach Lewis said often on his pod to where when he's doing like hair splitting for a third team all NBA or stuff like that, where it comes to defaults to actually, I think this guy's just better. And I do wonder as this race is super close between Jokic and Shea, in my opinion, how many of the voters are going to default to. Yeah, but like I, Jokic just won a title. Or I know, like, if we're just starting a draft or something, I think Jokic is better than Shea. And that may just be a tiebreaker. But you look at some of the advanced stuff, like, Shea quietly has the league in EPM. He has the lead in, like, the cumulative stat of estimated wins. And obviously, you're averaging over 30 points per game with this kind of efficiency while also providing this kind of impact defensively. Like, it's hard to argue against that while the Thunder are currently the number one seed. But also, Jokic isn't far off in the advanced stuff. He's averaging, as you said, averaging a triple-double post-All-Star break. I think he is, he is at worst the second best player in basketball. And I think most would agree, like he's the top dog right now. And the Nuggets are rolling to this degree. And we talked about the defense with him. I, I'd probably say like Shea by two strands of hair right now for number one. But I don't, Jokic is right there. He's been insane. I'm glad you said that. I'm glad, you, not because I have an opinion right now. Because again, this is, I'm just, I'm, I wanted to sort of qualify the tiers because, uh, I will vote, I think this year, I think, I assume I'll have a vote. They, they tell you, you know, a couple of weeks out, um, and I will wait till the very last minute 
I, I did it last year. I will wait. I did it with All Star this year. I will wait to the very last minute. And um, I'm glad you said Shea though, because coming off of that Wemby conversation, I just didn't want all of Oklahoma City to hate us. You know what I mean? <laughs> I just didn't want that. <laughs> You, you know, I was thinking yesterday, like we had the uh, the Thunder conversation super early in the year, or maybe it was heading into the season. And you asked, like, what's the high end for OKC? And I said front court. Uh, front court. I bet uh, I got home court. Home court in the playoffs. Home court in the playoffs. Yeah, court. Home court in the playoffs. Yeah. I was like, yeah. And you, and so and like, by the way, when you said that, you meant fourth seed, just to be clear. Like, that's what I took away from when you saying that. I, I don't think you meant the number one seed in the West. Right. I, I did like one seed was lower in the totem pole. I did think like two or three would be attainable for them, especially like just regular season. They'll turn out the wins and then we'll get into the postseason questions. But like to that point, like, no, I didn't see one seed as like a serious, um, a serious achievement for them this year. They have blown my expectations out of the water. And I feel like I've been like the Thunder guy outside of outside of Thunder media, naturally. I feel like I've been that guy for the last two, three years. I've been super impressed with what they've been able to do. Like watching them against Phoenix last night and watching Shea just take over after a slow start in the first quarter. He just, you know, we talked about Wimby and his pull-up threes. Shea suddenly knocking down 40% of his pull-up threes is also a terrifying thought considering what he's doing on pull-ups inside the arc, what he does as a driver, isn't getting to the free throw line as much as he did last year, but still gets to the free throw line a lot. Good luck defending that dude. And again, the defense has been so fun. Like the event creation is there, the deflections, um, the on-ball steals, some of the passing lane stuff. Like watching teams try to post up Shea is becoming one of my favorite games within the game. Because if you're able to get them and you have a bigger body, you can move them. But it takes so much effort to even attack that mismatch because he's so good at like slithering around as you're throwing the pass and getting steals that way. He's just a ton of fun to watch on both ends of the floor. I think it's the impact for Shea. Well, the hair splitting, splitting is going to be insane, but I think it's the impact and the fact that he's continued to build throughout the entire season that really elevates his case to me as far as developing a counter all the time. You think you have one thing figured out. You don't because, okay, we're going to move the ball. I'm going to drive left. I'm going to set you up. I'm going to stop, pop right there. You want to go under on screens and go three. And now you have all of this in your brain with the best driver <laughs> volume wise in the league who continues to straight line drive and hit you. And so, that being so impactful for a team that didn't have the same expe- expectations is tough. Then you also have Jokic, who's doing this every single night for a machine in Denver and grabbing that mindset. It's something JJ mentioned as far as Jokic sending that text. Usually every year, we kind of get the Coach Michael Malone rant at some point, right? Like, hey, these guys got to, we got to, we got to, we got to, these guys, do you want to win a championship? And now it's Jokic doing it. And to me, in my head, I'm like, that's some growth right there. And so I don't, I don't know that like the hair splitting between those two is going to be nasty in particular. The five overall is a really great list. I feel like Tatum, Tatum gets hit probably because these guys are doing some historic statistical things to a degree, fair or unfair. Like Giannis, 30, 10, and 5, shooting 60% from the field. When have we seen that? Hmm. There we go. No. <laughs> so you know <laughs> what I mean? And so I think – Tatum deserves credit for not only improving, but improving within the context of a stronger unit to where we have these nights where six minutes in, Jason Tatum hasn't taken a shot. You look up at halftime, Jason Tatum has 22 points. That's not necessarily his fault. That's, hey, I'm really good. I'm going to do and take what I do well and elevate this team. So I think it should be a fun conversation. I have a feeling it's going to get nasty quick, but... I think the all five of those are deserving. And then, you know me, I like to go with the subs, six, seven, eight, nine. Like, like you ready? You ready for the love? You just want to let everybody be in the MVP conversation. I get it. I get it. You don't want to offend anybody. I don't, you don't want to offend anybody. Um, have you seen that guy's mentions? I don't blame him. <laughs> guys, have you seen my mentions? Fuck out of here, dude. <laughs> you don't want to. I wouldn't blame you, you either. <laughs> Some days I, I just like, I'm like, you know what? I see, I see in that bottom right corner, I see that 20 plus. I see that little 20 plus. I'm not going to, I'm not going to click on it. I'm not going to click on it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's all reasonable guys. It's all reasonable. Uh, you know, I, it's interesting because I've, I've called a couple of Clippers game recently and I've, I've referenced Ka- Kawhi having 
no holes in his game. And with Shea this year, I'm comfortable saying that about him. No holes in his game. The way he's shot the ball off the dribble, yeah, obviously we knew he was a good mid-range scorer, knew he was a good post-up player, but the three-point stuff has been, has been awesome. Can't guard him. Can't guard him. Real quick, just on some of the basketball reference stuff, I know you referenced the EPM stuff. Win shares per 48, which is a stat that's oftentimes very uh, correlated with who wins MVP. Jokic um, is number one, and you said splitting hairs. He's number one uh, with a thousandth percentage of point higher than Shea in win shares per 48. Giannis third. <laughs> uh, box plus minus, Jokic one. Sizable lead on, on Shea and Luka. Um, Giannis five. Uh, Jokic number one in offensive box plus minus, defensive box plus minus, and value over replacement player. Total win share, Shea number one by a hair. This time, if my math is correct, a tenth of a point over Jokic. Uh, Giannis three, Luka four, Sabonis five. Shout out to Sabonis, who's having an all NBA season. And Tatum is eight. Um, you know, I was talking about Wembenyama and the thinking part. There's I think a handful of players that think the game at a higher level than anyone else. Jokic is one of those guys. Um, I know, shout out to Rob Perez who on Twitter, posts amazing stuff. Great follow. Um, but there was a play late in the game where they get, they're, they're slowing the ball down. It's like, let's score here and let's, let's end the game essentially. And Murray brings it up the left side so they can get to their two their high high two man action. Uh, and Jokic is over in the right quadrant and he's he's like pointing and directing traffic and he's trying to get one of the offensive players to go to the right corner, get off the weak side, go to the right corner, which kind of leaves LeBron in this uncomfortable position if Jokic happens to catch it on the roll, which he does. LeBron's got a shooter in the left corner. He's got Aaron Gordon in the dunker and. Jokic catches it. He turns and spins. In the game, I thought he shot a jump hook. And he shoots a jump hook lob. He does actually sometimes, he shoots a lob sometimes to Aaron Gordon. It's the fucking coolest thing in the world. <laughs> like he shoots, like he's shooting a normal floater and he'll just shoot a lob. This time he shot a jump hook to Aaron Gordon. It's that stuff that I just fucking love. It's like I'm playing chess I'm manipulating the chessboard, which brings me to something that I've touched on before, but I want to use this opportunity to touch on it again. I thought about bringing this up during the broadcast. There's just not enough time and space to really talk about this. Joe Boylan, who was one of my player development coaches when I was in New Orleans, he's now with Minnesota and Chris Finch. He is a great dude. He's a little psycho. And I think he'll admit he's a little psycho, but he's super into the cognitive part of being an athlete. And he posted this thing the other day that I just fucking loved. And it's what is basketball athleticism? And people get offended when I bring this up because it's like, oh, you're pointing out the white guys whenever you talk about like, Oh, deceleration and not vertical jumping. Fine. I don't, it's not, that's not important. The point is there's more to being a great athlete in basketball than just being able to jump high and run fast. Certainly part of it. So he had these, he had these, uh, I think it's 11 things. Some are physical, some are cognitive, right? And it's like the vertical plane, right? Of course, jumping high. Jokic doesn't have that. Change of direction, agility, balance, coordination, mobility, strength, reflexes, stamina, change of pace, deceleration, right? I talk about deceleration all the time. Then the cognitive side, anticipation, pattern recognition, and spatial awareness. And with spatial awareness in particular, I think that's the advantage that certain guys have. He called it court mapping. And that's what Jokic was doing on that play. He was mapping the court. There was a clip when I was prepping for the game, guys, and I, 
I fucking rewound it like six times in slow motion. So they get to their five out delay. He's got the ball at the top. He's got, they've got good pressure on the ball. It's, it was against the Warriors. Good pressure on the ball. And he's kind of half turned towards the right side of the, ba- the basketball court. But he can't completely see Andrew Wiggins in the low man spot. And he's got a shooter in the corner. Two players on the right the right high quadrant get into a high split. Christian Brown ends up cutting back door. As soon as he cuts back door, he's not looking directly at the corner, but he's mapped out the court, as he so often does. He's mapped out the court. As soon as Christian Brown back cuts, he delivers a fucking bullet pass to the corner. And if you watch it in slow-mo, when he delivered the bullet pass, It's at the exact moment that Andrew Wiggins takes a step with his right foot towards the basket to tag the cutter. The spatial awareness and court mapping of Jokic is fucking absurd. Ball goes to the corner. Now it's a two-way stunt. Wiggins has, Wiggins, by the way, he still gets a decent contest. Ball goes in, three points. There are so many times where Jokic does this. LeBron does this. James Harden does this. Luka does this. We brought up Tatum. Tatum's getting better at this part of his game, the court mapping. Again, this is part of being an NBA athlete. It's not just jumping high or running fast. It's the court mapping and spatial awareness. It's the balance. It's the deceleration. And, you know, I think about what makes the greatest players the greatest players, it's that most of them have nearly every one of these traits. Most of them do. Which brings me to LeBron James for the algorithm. <laughs> LeBron, <laughs> LeBron has all of them. <laughs> LeBron has all of them. That's what has made him arguably the greatest player of all time, but certainly one of the two, in my opinion, two greatest players of all time. He's got all of that stuff. The court mapping is there, the spatial awareness. He's got the D cell. He's got the acceleration. He's got the agility, the mobility, the stamina, the strength, obviously the vertical. And to watch him at 39 still be able to do this. Like I, I said, uh, I said Wednesday night, I, I don't take it for granted. I like, it's just fun. It's fun to watch great athletes. I don't give a fuck about the GOAT debate. It's fun. I enjoy (laughs) watching great athletes play. All these guys we were just talking about, whether it's the MVP or the rookie of the year, like it's just watching that Phoenix game last night and watching Shea take over. It's fun. It's fun. It's meant to be fun. It's meant to be fun. Any comments on the court mapping thing? Because I saw Nakaias get really excited there. Oh, I just love when you get to that uh, into that bag. And like for me, as a sucker for really good passers and quick processes on the court, like this is why I gravitate to your Jokic's, to your Chris Paul. Steve makes fun of me all the time. Um, just guys like that just know where everyone's going to be, what the rotations are supposed to be. So I can just take a dribble to the side here, knowing that you're going to try to cheat inside. I can fire a bullet uh, just like that. As you were talking about the Jokic pass, my mind immediately went to like the Austin Reeves gamble in that Nuggets Lakers game. And as soon as he tried the blind side, Jokic, Jokic just fires the bullet to Michael Porter Jr. for a left corner three to kind of seal that game late. It's just like to be able to process things that quickly and to have that kind of pattern recognition, knowing if I set the screen this way and I'm rolling this way, this is the role, man. I know he's supposed to come here. And just having that innate and being able to make quick process, uh, make quick decisions from there, it's a lot of fun for me. So like watching Jokic do that into the LeBron portion, it just feels... So it's so automatic for him and has been for a very long time. And the fun for me with this LeBron season has been him literally doing whatever is asked of him. Like as I was getting some stats together for this recent run and post all-star break, 30 points, six boards, nine assists, 61% on twos, 52% from three, which like the three point number isn't sustainable, but the fact that he's knocking those down in addition to everything else is ridiculous. But it's like against the Clippers when he leads that comeback and it's a whole bunch of pull-up jumpers. And at the end of the game, it's let me get this switch and let's see what you guys do out of that. 
taking all those jumpers. He had seven drives in that Clippers game. It's like, huh, this is interesting. And they were able to reel this in. You go to the Washington game, and it's like, okay, cool. I'm not going to just move all around the court. Season high and pick and rolls ran in that game. Let me just diagnose everything you're going to do and make passes out of that. His ability to just kind of shape shift roles. I'll be the jump shooter. I'll be the driver. We'll just run the offense through the post if we need to. I'll be the on-ball screener if necessary. We'll run inverted stuff with Austin Reeves or D'Lo if we need to. He can just do whatever he wants, to your point, because he is so skillful, but he also has all these athletic things, the floor mapping and stuff in particular, to where he can just kind of go in and say, okay, in this quarter, I noticed that they've been doing this. We're just going to spam this action, or we're going to spam action on this side of the floor because we're going to pick on that guy because he doesn't know what he needs to be doing on the weak side. And I just really appreciate that portion of the LeBron experience. It's the data that the greats collect that always stands out to me. It's what they grasp with what you're doing and how they counter it and use it and flip it against you. So Nikai's mentioned a lot of LeBron points that I, I wanted to hit, but even that Nuggets game, I'm going to be a screener. Aaron Gordon doesn't want to switch. He's going to be in a drop. Guess what? I can get a roll. I can get a pop and drive this close out. I can get a pop and swing to the next side, get the matchup against Jamal Murray. Now I diagnose and wait to see if you're helping. I think as you build as a player, and even stretching it out past LeBron, Jokic, and Wimby, I gauge it on how do defenses start to treat you. And then to elevate, how are you now punishing these defenses for how they treat you? And the timeliness of these baskets or these plays that the greats make when they hit them, and now they force a defense to react. You go back to that Clippers game, they wanted to switch. They were totally fine until LeBron kept making the shots he had to hit to make you feel, oh, I'm uncomfortable with this. Let's switch and double. And now, cool, you got me one time. Now we're cutting, and now I'm hitting the cutter, and we're playing out of it. I think that's the real fun of these top players to where you can show me this. You might have got me once. Hey, AD had a couple great blocks for Roman. Hey, bud. Guess what? I'm going to punish Rui, and I'm going to wait. Game winning time, we're going to play that AD help against you. Watch Aaron Gordon snake and mess around with these cuts. And now, guess what? I can either kick, I can throw the lob. All these shots, as JJ mentioned, that have looked like shots, those now turn into lobs. What are you going to do about it? Yeah, I, there was a point early in the game where AD's in that help against Rui, and he just, instead of like, because you know, Jokic, a lot of times, he will. It's that left, it's that counter, you know, go middle, counter, left shoulder spin, jump hook off the glass. AD got him early in the game. And then it was just like, no, I, I, I can just like put my body into Hachimura and just shoot a seven foot fall away going middle and no one can get to that shot, right? It's, my God, this is, I love this conversation. This is so fun. You guys bring, uh, the shape shifting thing from LeBron is, is interesting to me because I don't think he's, always done it at this level he's been at times more ball dominant and then i think some of this is age right he's conserved his energy we had a great stat in our pregame notes like he's the fourth slowest player on average in terms of tracking movement from the second spectrum cam cameras he's the fourth slowest player on average he conserves his energy he's allowed d'angelo russell to initiate offense he's allowed Austin Reeves to initiate offense. Side note, real quick, you brought up the post-ups. So Anthony Davis has gotten the third most post-ups in the league this year, and he's shooting 56%. And he gets fucking crushed. <laughs> he gets crushed <laughs> after this game from the media. After this game on, so, oh, you know, AD didn't show up and fucking blah, blah, blah. I asked Matthew Williams, I go, Matt, my un my untrained eye again. I'm not a fucking tracking camera. <laughs> it didn't feel like Anthony Davis really got a lot of post ups or the offense ran through him in that game. Can you check on that for me? Got one post up against the Nuggets. <laughs> he's third in the NBA in total post ups, and he's shooting 56 percent on the season. He's had some success against Jokic in the past, posting him up. How do you go through an entire game and post up once? Anthony Davis, once? By the way, most assists he's had in a season, or you know, most assists per game in a season since like 2014, 2015. He's, he's been the most doubled guy. He knows how to play out of a double if the Nuggets double. How do you go through a whole game and only post up once? 
How does that happen? <laughs> and then we're going to kill Anthony Davis? It's Listen, it's, Anthony Davis is a fucking center. He doesn't bring the ball up the court. He doesn't dictate the offense. He's not the same version of a hub that Sabonis or Jokic is. You can't kill the guy if he doesn't get the ball. Extreme Twitter voice. He should demand the ball. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fuck out of here. Man. <laughs> <laughs> like the Anthony Davis that. conversation is always funny because it's like he can't do enough. But when he faces the Nuggets in particular, it's funny because it's like you said, like, hey, why isn't he getting these post ups? It's like everyone talks about how exploitable Denver's defense is. And we've already dug into like why that isn't really true. But everyone talks about that portion of it. The one thing that Denver has in the front court in particular is a whole bunch of size and length. You have MPJ 6'10", Aaron Gordon's big and bulky, and then you have Jokic. Like, he should get more post touches because he's been very good at that. Also, just conceptually, I don't know if I'm yelling about Anthony Davis not seeing a set defense against 3'6'10", or 6'8", plus dudes in the front court. And then defensively, it is, why isn't he guarding Jokic? And it's like, one, Jokic can just bully him like he does 99.9% of the rest of the league and score. 47 and more, and 82 versus Anthony Davis going back to last year's playoffs. Like, that's incredible stuff. So, like, there's that. And then you will give AD the Jokic matchup. It's like, wait, why, why, are, why is Denver getting all these offensive rebounds? Wait, why are these cuts and seals for Aaron Gordon open? Why are they getting so much good stuff in the paint? I wonder why. It's because you've removed Anthony Davis. From, <laughs> hey, where is, where is Jokic getting the ball? Like he's above the break doing handoff stuff. He's receiving screens to get catches at the elbow. You're removing Anthony Davis from the area in which Laker fans are yelling he should get more defensive player of the year, love. It's because he's he does everything defensively. But it's because of the impact that he has at the rim. You remove him from the rim, and depending on like where LeBron is spaced or what quarter it is for LeBron, because to the energy conservation point, like he wants to chill and then make the big points when they matter. If those guys are out of the paint, who do you have doing anything at the rim? Like the conversation with the Lakers and the Nuggets matchup in particular should just be Jokic has an answer for everything. He's incredible versus why isn't Anthony Davis averaging 38, 27, 4, and 6 while playing 43 minutes per game? I'm sorry. Like if that's a cop out, I'll take the L on that. But like I, it's it's weird to me. I, I think that's that's a fair and reasonable point. It's fair and it's reasonable. I don't think that's a like a absurd take at all. I have your back on this, Nikias. I appreciate that. <laughs> Steve, let's wrap. What do you got for me? I had one question for the algo. You get a game plan for one of these three players. That's your only job. You have to find a game plan to stop one of these players. Wimby, Jokic, LeBron. What's your order? In terms of difficulty? Yeah. Difficulty, which one would you choose? Which one? Oh. Uh, I think, I guess, I guess Wimby's like one by default, I guess, just because he's the newest. And like, in theory, he may just take bad shots or we may just have a strong dude that can make stuff tougher for him. Okay. Or at bare minimum, well, at least we don't trust these other dudes. So let's just get the ball out of his hands. Um, I guess Wimby's one by default. Yeah, see, I gave you an out. Now it doesn't yeah. get fun. Yeah, it, sure, it sure doesn't. <laughs> it's, it's Wimby 1. It's probably LeBron 2. Because I have more guys that I could, in theory, like play off of. And also, like, LeBron may just be chilling for the first two or three quarters. So we can go that way. Like, and one thing I was looking up with the pick and roll stuff with LeBron in particular, like, he's seen more switches than he ever has. And so to the declining but still elite athleticism, like, we can at least get away with some stuff and have more of a scheme answer, even though he's really good. Yoga just three. Because, like, he just... What are we doing? Like, Rui was guarding him so you can keep AD at the rim, and then he's bullying Rui. You put AD on him, he's bullying AD too, and now you don't have help at the rim. And then he has the passes, and... I, I think Yoga is probably the guy that I just don't want to have to deal with of this list. It's a great question. And I'm not sure how to answer this, because when... We were talking about most difficult, and then the guy started with Wemby being one, and then he went the opposite order, and then I was like, okay, I'm not sure really which <laughs> direction we're going here. No, he's not with me on this one. <laughs> but <laughs> no, I, I would just say as a general answer, like with Jokic, you know, I, you talk to 
people around the NBA, talk to smart people that cover the game like you guys. I just don't think, th I think he's got an answer for everything. So I, I think he would be, he's the most difficult guy. Cause I, it's so funny. Oh, look at, look at the Lakers like last year, but look at the Lakers. They're going to make Jokic score and AD is going to help off, you know, it's just like, well, you guys lost 4-0, right? <laughs> so that's, that's the game plan for Jokic. Like uh, you talk to some coaches, well, we don't want to double them. Oh, okay. All right. So he's going to go 14 for 20 and he's probably still going to get eight assists. <laughs> like it's like, it, it's, it's stupid. Cause the thing with Jokic too is like, you can say, all right, we're not going to double. And that's fine. But at any point in time, Jokic should be like, you know what? I'm just going to go catch at the elbow. And what the fuck are you going to do is I, I use the word orbit in the open. And it's like, what the fuck are you going to do is my teammates orbit around me and I make every single right read and pass. Oh, and by the way, five seconds on the shot clock. I can still get any shot I want. He's the guy. Like, he's the guy for me that was like, yeah, there's just not a good answer. There's just not a good answer. And by the way, there's a, there's a lot of players. You gave me three to choose from. There's a lot of players that there's not a lot of good answers or there's no good answer for. There, there, there's, there's several players. There's several players. But I think in, in the case of Jokic where I, I would give the Nuggets as an organization because Tim Con Conley, of course, to start, Calvin Booth now, the, the pieces around him and the coaching from Michael Malone, you know, when they, when they, they figure out their five out, whether it's, you know, uh, five, five out up, where they're setting the back screen out of the corner and then slipping and either getting a rim, uh, a rim cut or a three from the wing. They go to that five out backside, you know, at any point in time, they could just say, fuck it. We're going to just do two man action with Jamal. It, it's we're going to do two man with Jamal Murray. And what's your answer there? What's your answer there? What, what is your answer? Like, there's not a good one. There's not a good the one. <laughs> the answer is help exclamation <laughs> point. Hey, no, nothing else said was wrong, but spoken by two people who did not have to hope Sergey Karasev could guard LeBron James. <laughs> well, I don't even know what that reference is. It's me. It was a reference to the old man and three with Jared Allen. I was in Brooklyn uh, oh. <laughs> with that with that roster, and yeah, yeah, it was fun. It was, it was, oh, it was fun. I love that. Sorry, I love that. <laughs> that's good. That's good. That's good. Uh, fellas. Always fun. This was a great combo. Uh, wow, we went long. Jesus. Um, <laughs> all right. It was worth it. It was worth it. It was worth my time. All right. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you.